Hello, this is Kerry Schutz from MathWorks. In this video, I'm going to show a quick and dirty transfer function measurement technique uh, called the swept sign measurement. You could also think of it as a stepped sign measurement because our excitation U here will consist of a finite discrete a set of frequencies. And of course, I, then I want to contrast it with other forms of excitation. We could use the most similar one being a chirp, which is truly a continuously and smoothly swept sine wave where we start at some start frequency, we end up at some stop frequency, and we linearly increase in frequency between that start and stop. Of course, you could also use other broadband sources as listed here, uh, step inputs, uh, impulse inputs, and random noise. Um, but in this case today, we're focusing on use of the uh, step sign excitation. I'm using a MATLAB script uh, to build up uh, that MATLAB vector U, and then I'm importing it into, I, I compute it here, and then I import it via the signal from workspace block in, uh, in Simulink. So it's kind of the, the bridge between MATLAB and Simulink. And then I want to play these samples out during simulation at a rate of FS samples per second, all set inside of my MATLAB script. So in the MATLAB script, the first thing I do is I specify my frequencies of interest, or FOI, in a MATLAB vector. And I start at F1 of uh, 50 hertz, uh, I'm sorry, 100 hertz. I increase by 50 hertz increments up to 10 kilohertz. So 10 kilohertz is essentially my bandwidth of interest. Uh, for my device under test. And then I'm going to dwell at each frequency for n samples, where n here is set to 4 times 1024 or 4096. You can also see these numbers over here in the uh, MATLAB workspace. You can see there's n and there is fs, the sample rate is 102.4 kilohertz. If we take that ratio actually of n over fs, we're going to see that is 40 milliseconds. Uh, per uh, frequency, our dwell time. And as we see up here, I've already done it. Our length of our frequency of interest vector is 199 frequencies. And if you take 199 times our dwell time, you get an overall simulation time of 7.96 seconds. Okay, so that's the basic parameters of our signal generation. Now, one little subtlety to the way I generated the um, the, the excitation is I have a coefficient or amplitude variable A uh, as a prefix to, uh, as a multiplier in front of my sine uh, wave function. And that's because I want to be able to visually distinguish between one frequency and the next. So I just bump it or decrease it by 0 0.1 volts. Uh, this serves no real uh, measurement or computational purposes, strictly for ease of visualization in the model. Now, up above that section of code where I created the uh, device, or I created the uh, excitation, I also have a uh, section of code where I created my device under test using control systems toolbox functionality, in particular the TF function, where I carefully uh, created a notch filter with a notch at one kilohertz. We can see what that notch filter looks like here. It's a second order continuous time transfer function. As I said, our bandwidth of interest is 10 kilohertz, and then we're oversampling that by some amount, so our sample rate is 102.4 kilohertz. Of course, we could always look at the theoretical magnitude and phase response by running this section of code. We see, again, it's a one kilohertz notch filter with this 180 degree phase shift at that notch frequency. So that's what theory says. Now we want to see if we can duplicate that result empirically using our Simulink test bench and our step sign excitation. So let's go ahead and run the model. We're going to look at the uh, response on our scope. Uh, however, in between the device under test and, and the excitation signal from MATLAB is an analog anti-alias filter. Again, because this is a pure discrete time signal, it will have high frequency spectral replicas extending basically to infinity. So we only want to excite our device under test over the bandwidth of interest, that meaning a 0 to 10 kilohertz. So that's the purpose of that additional block. Then we'll be looking at the excitation and the response, and we'll be making a form of ratio of measurements, as all transfer function measurements tend to be ratioed of output over input. We're going to be doing the same thing in this model. Um, therefore, we can eliminate, shall we say, any sort of effect that the anti-alias filter or sampling uh, 
might induce in the response. So we want to get rid of that and focus just on the response of our device under test. Okay, so I'm going to run the model and we'll focus on the scope first with the input output trace. That being right here, we got, we're going to have the excitation on top. You notice it's relatively flat. And then we have our uh, response, which is not showing up as relatively flat here. Let me just see here. Uh, oh, I didn't have it scaled properly. So let's run that one more time. I didn't, I didn't have it scaled. I had it zoomed in. Let's run it one more time. So you can see uh, everything unfold in simulation time. We see something that looks like the notch characteristic uh, as we sweep in time. Of course, we don't know exactly what frequency that corresponds to. We're going to suspect it's one kilohertz, but there's no way to tell that on our scope since once again in this model, we are using our scope as sort of a poor man's spectrum analyzer. Um, you know, this technique of swept sign, uh, you know, really predates digital electronics such that you could make transfer function measurements without having access to uh, digital electronics that could compute, you know, things like digital filters or FFTs. Um, that would have been either not possible or cost prohibitive at, at some point back in time. So the swept sign approach was a way to make transfer functions essentially in an all analog fashion. And so what you see here is the scope is, is uh, as we increase in frequency, and you can see the little steps uh, where we are changing frequencies between one frequency and the next on these 40 millisecond boundaries. There's 100 hertz, 150 hertz, 200 hertz, and 250 hertz, and so on. And as we again sweep up in frequency, you can see we're clearly notching out at some frequency. Of course, it's hard to tell by just looking here. It looks like around 0.7 something seconds we are notching out uh, that frequency, whatever frequency that is. If you wanted to see, you could certainly zoom in on the scope above it to that corresponding section of the excitation, and it'll tell us that that section is indeed frequency. The, the scope here is measuring frequency. It's one killer. So it looks like, yeah, it's doing a great job of notching uh, at that frequency. Of course, if we, if we zoomed in vertically, we could probably see that it wasn't truly zero. It's, you know, it's down in the, in the microvolts. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a pretty low frequency. And then as we zoom back out again and we look at maybe some of the adjacent, like this would be 950 hertz right next to it. If we zoom in on that, indeed, it does say it's 950 hertz. And we can see the amplitude. Well, if we auto zoom again or auto scale vertically, uh, we'll see it goes up to about a little bit over 0.1 volt. So there's about a, a 10x attenuation factor on the voltage at that frequency of 950 hertz. We could also, of course, zoom in and then place uh, vertical markers on a peak, let's say, of the input, a peak of the output, and measure the time difference between them. And then you could get some idea of the delay, and the delay, of course, would map to a particular uh, phase uh, measurement at that frequency. So, again, we're not going to go through all those tedious steps, but you could certainly do that. Look there, it says it right here, it's about 247 microseconds from, from marker one to marker two. Um, but that would that would be tedious if we try to do that for all of our 199 frequencies of interest, looking at the uh, peaks and looking at the delays between them. And so that's the very purpose behind our magnitude measurement block and our phase measurement subsystems is to uh, expedite and to automate uh, that process that I just described manually, visually using the scope. So let's take the magnitude measurement real quick. What we're doing here is we're sampling, I'll turn on sample time colors for this purpose, and sometimes it just kind of helps uh, explain the flow. We are uh, inputting our analog signal. We're sampling at 102.4 kilohertz. Uh, we can see that right up here on our timing legend, 102.4 kilohertz in red. Uh, we buffer up 2,048 samples and compute the RMS value over that 2,048 samples. So we go from a vector to a scalar, one RMS value per 2,048 samples at the input both on the excitation and the response. We downsample, we throw away every other sample, we therefore we keep every other sample. We ratio that output over input and we come up with a linear gain, which we convert to dB, which we display on our scope. And that's what you see on the scope right here. You see two traces actually, you see a lin linearly increasing frequency on the top trace and then you see the magnitude response on the bottom trace or at least the shape of it. Again, it is on a frequency domain type measurement on a time domain piece of measurement gear, I mean a scope. And so the x-axis is in time, not in frequency. If we wanted to know the frequency, we'd have to look at this other trace, which tells you the instantaneous frequency. 
and that would correspond to one kilohertz at that notch frequency. Okay, so that's the magnitude response view. Now, a couple questions might arise is, is, well, why are you throwing away every other sample? And that is because I'm allowing for settling time. So I'm basically throwing out the first 20 milliseconds of every 40 millisecond frequency section to allow for settling. Of course, that's probably overly conservative. We could probably shorten up that window or discard far less, but you know, I just made it easy and said, let's discard the first half and we'll keep and process the second half to measure, um, measure the magnitude response here. I also have another uh, few uh, display devices in addition to the scope. I've also got an array plot block and a spectrum analyzer block. You can also use these to display the magnitude response as well. The advantage of using these is that you can actually get the x-axis to display in frequency instead of just seconds as this one does. You don't need that extra trace to tell you what the frequency is. Uh, the downside of using these blocks is that they're buffered, so therefore you need to wait for the entire buffer to arrive before you can display the results. Whereas with the scope here, uh, you can just run and observe the response live in stream as it's coming in, not waiting for the entire sweep to complete. So that, that has some nice charm to it. Okay. All right, so back to our model. We also have in there for the phase measurement as well. So if I go back up to the top of the model, we've got, again, the input and the output coming into our phase response uh, measurement block. With this block, what we're doing here is um, we are looking at the excitation and we are looking at the zero crossings on the excitation, positive going zero crossings. And we're doing the same thing on the response. So we're looking for positive going zero crossings on both the excitation and the response. And then we are going to latch the time at which those uh, zero crossings occurred. Again, only on the positive edges in this particular use case. Of course, we could configure it to be different, should we so choose. Then we're going to latch the time at which those zero crossings occurred using this triggered subsystem uh, approach. That will latch, you know, this modeling a clock here, the system clock or simulation clock and simulink, which would corresponds like a high frequency counter or precision clock in your system. You latch that time on the excitation, you latch that positive edge uh, or edge, you know, uh, portion of the signal, I should say, since it's not a clock, it's a, it's a sine wave, that positive going portion of the waveform on the response, take the difference, and that is going to be uh, a delay value between the output and the input. Now, of course, um, that could be um, the delay from there, there's, and there's no keeping track here, I should say, of which edge is which. I mean, is it input leading output or whatever? It turns out not to matter. <laughs> as long as you're sampling uh, that waveform consistently, and that's the purpose of this pulse generator block here, it doesn't matter what you're re me measuring so much with respect to. It just matters the convention you use, and you're measuring every single positive going edge, and you're subtracting in a particular order, then you sample in a particular order and then you get shall we say uh, the right consistent uh, delay or phase measurement output with respect to input um, we convert that delay value to phase uh, via the 360 times the freq instantaneous frequency times the delay gives you the phase in degrees then we wrap it um, we were displaying here a wrap phase as opposed to unwrapped and then uh, that goes to our scope OK, and likewise, down here, I'm only using the scope as the display device. You could also, uh, as I did with the magnitude response, you could use an array plot block. You could use a spectrum analyzer. Uh, you could use an X, Y graph, um, different different ways to go. I should point out that, again, what I'm showing here is not um, the accepted convention or the standard approach for making a swept sign measurement. This is just something I, shall we say, dreamt up or created. It's kind of a heuristic approach to um, converting a swept sign uh, inputs and outputs and mapping that to a magnitude and phase uh, response view. Uh, on commercial grade analyzers that, that have a swept sign measurement mode, I'm sure they do it differently, uh, but this just so happens to be one way to go about it in a simulation framework. Um, one, and I, and I will point out that my measurement approach is not, is not the most robust. Uh, in practice, uh, my zero crossing approach would be subject uh, to um, false positives or false negatives 
when it comes to zero crossing. So you would want to have a zero, a more robust zero crossing detection mechanism that either have hysteresis or some kind of more constraints on it to uh, prevent those false triggers of zero crossings. Um, and if you were doing other sorts of uh, a signal feature extraction like peak finding, you would want to add that sort of robustness um, built into the peak finding algorithm. Uh, a similar story for um, the magnitude response measurement. I'm using RMS, ratio of RMS, but in some in some cases that may not be the most robust way to detect the gain. Uh, you may go for a different mechanism. Another thing you might do in a real model or, or a real hardware description, uh, a real hardware implementation of a swept sign measurement is to bandpass filter the output in accordance with what excitation you're driving the system at the input with. So we're not looking and including energy that's, shall we say, out of the excitation band. And so, you know, just many things you can do to add a level of robustness to the measurement that we're clearly just not getting into in our kind of quick and dirty uh, transfer function measurement approach here. Another option uh, that you could also um, employ would be to post-process the data. In other words, just use the simulate model as a means to drive your device under test and log the data kind of like what we're doing over here where we're logging the input and output data, where you see these like Wi-Fi type logging symbols. Uh, you could log those, they go to the MATLAB workspace, and then you could employ a MATLAB script uh, to, um, you know, essentially do the same thing I'm doing under these blocks, which is either compute RMS or look for zero crossings, looks for peaks, and map all of that information to a magnitude and phase response curve. So that would be a subject for different video, but, you know, those are kind of, you know, some of the possibilities and some of the issues that you might run into using a model like this, if, shall we say, you, it was in the presence of noise or nonlinearities. Okay, that's all I really want to say for now on the subject, subject of the swept sign measurement. Um, I hope you found it helpful and informative. So until next time, thank you for tuning in.